So I will start with a brief introduction and just by saying uh, welcome to everyone uh, to today's uh, CDY lecture. And as you know, this fall, we are focusing on topics related to multi-messenger uh, GRBs, gravitational waves and neutrinos. And today we are really happy to have Francis Halzen uh, giving us this lecture, who is the principal investigator of IceCube and the Villas Research Professor and the Gregory Bright Professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And the title of today's talk is High Energy Neutrinos, Connections with Gamma Ray Sources and Multi-Messenger Astronomy. So just a quick introduction. I mean, Francis, of course, needs no introduction. We know he's a theorist. He's studying problems at the interface of particle physics, astrophysics, and cosmology. Uh, he received his PhD from uh, Belgium, University of Louvain, and then he has had vast experience working with neutrino telescopes, starting with AMANDA, which was the first generation neutrino observatory and served as proof of concept for IceCube. So the field has really gained tremendous impetus with the, uh, with the first observation of PV neutrinos with IceCube, evidence of extraterrestrial neutrinos detected by IceCube. So it's a really exciting and happening field. And, and we're very excited for the prospects for the future. Uh, Francis has held several visiting professorships and positions and received many honors. It's just too numerous to list here. Uh, but I'm just going to say that some recent recognitions include the Homi Baba Prize and medal from IUPAP, the Bruno Rossi Prize, the American Astronomical Society, uh, the Bruno Ponte Corvo Prize, uh, Joint Institute for Nuclear Research Scientific Council. So with great pleasure, let us welcome Francis and get started. And as a reminder, the talk will be roughly 50 minutes, I think 50 to 55 minutes. And then we will follow up with questions. Uh, Felix will lead that discussion. Feel free to use the chat. And then we hope that we will have a general discussion at the end. And just a quick note that we are recording the session for our YouTube archives. So please mute yourself if you're not speaking. So thank you again, Francis, and please get started. Thank you. And thanks for not mentioning the year of my PhD. <laughs> so uh, you have been looking at uh, the menu for today, and I will not assume that everybody's familiar here with IceCube. So I'll give a, a quick and fast introduction to ice cube so that everybody can follow the rest of the discussion. Um, so the idea of doing neutrino astronomy literally goes back to the 1950s. And uh, so many people had the idea that there is actually no name connected to it. But the idea was very simple people realized that with protons that get bent in magnetic fields, it was difficult to find cosmic ray sources. Uh, gamma rays, of course, uh, emitted by cosmic ray sources, you do detect them, but from very low, large distances, they are absorbed on the microwave background, which is something that I will discuss at length in the middle of the talk. Of course, neutrinos, uh, we know everything about neutrinos because they follow the standard model. Uh, at high energy, they have no mass, so they have, they're just like photons. And they reach us, unlike photons, from the beginning of time and the edge of the universe. So they are the perfect uh, messenger. The problem is that they are uh, difficult to detect. And that's the problem we have been trying to solve for a long time, of course, I'll, I'll mention it in a moment. How do you produce neutrinos? Well, in an, you need an accelerator and a target. And so what happens is you shoot a proton beam in a target and uh, you produce pions that decay into neutrinos and you have a neutrino beam. And at an accelerator, you have a tick target, so nothing but the neutrinos come out. Everything else is absorbed. Now, remember, that may happen at uh, a cosmic accelerator. And this will be kind of a theme of my, of my talk that will come back later. So, but, uh, so what we are thinking of here, that uh, you tap the gravitational energy of a supermassive black hole, in some way and accelerate particles. 
And these black holes are surrounded by radiation or hydrogen or whatever. And uh, so then you have a proton beam interacting with this radiation and you produce charged pions which decay into neutrinos, but inevitably you produce neutral pions of twice the energy actually that decay into gamma rays. And uh, so one conceptual picture of uh, a very popular cosmic accelerator theory is that they are accelerated uh, by, active, act, by active galaxies. And active galaxies have a supermassive black hole that uh, with an accretion disk where particles can be accelerated and the black hole can accelerate particles and there can be a jet. And uh, the interesting thing for neutrino astronomy is that it is AGM, material builds up with very high densities. So not only you have particles accelerated at the accretion disk or near the black hole or in the base of the jet, but you have a lot of material, including uh, photons, uh, with which these accelerated particles can interact to produce neutrinos, because without the target, there are no neutrinos. So this is kind of a Disneyland for producing neutrinos. And so, uh, this is uh, the theoretical picture. There is a cocoon, and this cocoon you can recognize because it's so dense that it absorbs gamma rays, but you can recognize it by the X-ray emission. And so that's the picture I will have in mind when I discuss sources, the rest of this talk. Of course, by now I have introduced uh, multi-messenger astronomy, because when you produce pions by uh, P gamma interactions, the pion decay into a muon and a neutrino, and then the muon decays into a positron and two more neutrinos. And for each pion, there is a pi zero that decays into two gamma rays. Uh, so I already mentioned this is the multi messenger picture. You have a core of a galaxy that accelerate protons or, uh, and they interact with, with the light surrounding the galaxy. And uh, or with uh, atomic targets surrounding the core of the galaxy. And so you get this multi-messenger picture that's shown. And um, so the only difference is that the gamma rays of the source is far away is absorbed on the microwave background. But you should not forget that uh, gamma rays may already be absorbed and lose energy in the target that produces the neutrinos. So the problem to solve was that you know, we know how to detect neutrinos. You need water and photomultipliers. And this beautiful experiment did, does this in Japan. But theorists, after a couple of decades of work, came up with the idea that this experiment is 10,000 times too small to do neutrino astronomy. So the solution has been known since uh, 1960. Uh, and that is to use the following technique to build a 10,000 times bigger detector. And that is to put deep in a lake or in a, under the sea an array of photomultipliers. And then uh, you look for neutrinos coming through the earth. If you, so if you see something come to, coming through the earth, it can only be a neutrino. And so this neutrino will go through your detector. But like in our case, about one in a million will interact with a nucleus and convert themselves into a lepton by deep inelastic scattering. So uh, all the physics of this is again, totally known by the standard model. You produce a lepton that uh, is charged and that you can detect. If uh, this is a muon neutrino, you produce a muon, and the beauty of the muon is that at the energies of TeV to PeV we are working, it has a range of 50 uh, kilometers, uh, from 50 meters 
to, to more than 10 kilometers. And uh, it, of course, emits Cherenkov radiation. And this Cherenkov radiation, if you map it with your photomultiplier tubes, you have a telescope because you know the direction. In the late 80s, we developed the idea that it was easier uh, to put photo, to freeze photomultipliers in ice than to put them in the deep ocean. And uh, so this is the geographic South Pole. And this idea was workable because the National Science Foundation has stationed there. And you see here the station and the runway where the planes land, and this is the ice cube construction project. And so basically what we did is we transport one kilometer cube of uh, Antarctic ice, clear Antarctic ice, one and a half kilometer deep into a Cherenkov detector. So that's all there is to it. If you go one and a half kilometers be below the geographic South Pole, you have a kilometer cube of ice that's filled with 5,160 10 inch photomultipliers, the size of a, a basketball, roughly. Uh, this is the 10 inch photomultiplier. And if you go into the detector, the architecture is such that you have between 1.5 and 2.5 kilometer a string with a photomultiplier every 17 meters. So 60 photomultipliers per string. If you go 125 meters away, there is another string. And so if you deploy 86 of these strings, you fill a kilometer cube of ice. Uh, so that's the method. So here is the idea again. You have in blue here from the right a neutrino coming in. If it interacts, it if it's a muon neutrino, it will reproduce produce a muon. And here you see the online display of the detector. You see the muon going through the detector. And uh, the color, you follow the rainbow, gives the direction. And the size of the dots tells you how many photons were detected. So a little dot like this is one photoelectron. And a bigger dot may be like 10 to the 100 photoelectrons. So this is the animated version, in case you didn't get it. That's what you actually see. And uh, so that's size cube. We can now reconstruct this uh, muons to about, to typically at high energy, to 0 0.3 degrees. And so when you start taking data with the detector, what happens? Well, you see... Uh, cosmic ray muons. And uh, if you look through the Earth, you filter out the cosmic ray muons, and then you see the atmospheric neutrinos produced everywhere on Earth. And so you measure the atmospheric neutrino flux. So here is the number of events we see on the vertical axis versus the energy. This says muon energy proxy. I will not explain this. Think of this as the muon energy which is of course by standard model physics related to the neutrino energy. So our threshold here is about 100 GeV. And then when you rise above threshold, then you detect more and more atmospheric neutrinos. We detect about 100,000 per year. And uh, then of course the atmospheric neutrino flux drops with energy. And that's how we were lucky. Otherwise, we wouldn't see anything but atmospheric neutrinos. But if you reach something like 100 TV, between 10 to 100 TV, you see the measured atmospheric neutrino flux, which we can also fix, fit and is described by this blue line, doesn't represent the data anymore. We see a deviation that comes in clearly around 100 TeV, and that is a flux which is not produced in the atmosphere, but in the cosmos. And that's the discovery of uh, cosmic neutrinos. So again, 10 to the 11 atmospheric muons, 3,000 per second. 
100,000 atmospheric neutrinos per year, and the flux I showed you corresponds to some 200 cosmic neutrinos per year, uh, because we know the acceptance of the detector and the, the flux we measure, and so that's the number. So you see, uh, we have to dis detect these neutrinos in a huge background. So here is the E square phi, or E square the NDE plot, and the flux I just, in, uh, I just described uh, is with errors given by this pinkish line here. The other data points is another method we have to measure the cosmic neutrino flux. And instead of measuring new mu's, it measures nu e's and nu tau's. And nu e's and nu tau's, they make showers. You can see on the, on the right, you see the muon event. On the left, you see a shower develop. So this can be a tau neutrino or an electron neutrino that interacts and then produces an electromagnetic shower. And what you are looking at is the Cherenko flight of, the, uh, of, of uh, emitted by the shower. The energy of this uh, event is much easier to measure uh, than uh, the energy of a muon neutrino. However, the direction we at the moment can only measure to about eight degrees, so it's not very useful for the topic of today. These showers are useful for all, all kinds of other things, including confirming the measurement of the diffuse cosmic uh, of the diffuse uh, cosmic flux. And so you see the measurement in nui and nu tau is, is consistent with nu mu, as this. Uh, as, we shall, as these uh, neutrinos come from very far away, by the time they reach our detector, of course, every flavor comes in the same, come with the same number of neutrinos. The flux, this flux you are looking at is a is somewhere between e to the minus 2.3 and e to the minus 2.6, with a best fit around e to the minus 2.5. But I don't have to explain this community how difficult it is to determine in detail this flux, and I come back to that. However, we have updated these measurements uh, to, in this case, you are looking at eight years of data instead of a couple years in the previous plot. And so we actually confirm, you see, this uh, is the electron and tau measurement. And we get this e to the minus 2.48 with the diffuse flux, of course, multiplied by three. And we also, here is a, a measurement of muons uh, that start inside the detector. And again, here the measurements, this is uh, nine years of data. Uh, the measurement is consistent with this e to the minus 2.5. So I, I, I think this is where we are converging, but we continue to work on doing better measurement of the spectrum. We actually have discovered cosmic neutrinos in four different ways, uh, well above five sigma. The first measurement is approaching 10 sigma. Uh, we have seen tau neutrinos that cannot be produced in the atmosphere. Tau neutrinos are produced in the atmosphere by oscillations but not above 100 GeV. So if you see a high energy tau neutrino, you have discovered cosmic neutrinos again. And so a tau neutrino, of course, produced the shower I described, but at high energy, the tau it produces has a lifetime, which is like at one PeV, it's 50 meters. And you see also, you see later the tau decay and Early on, we found an event like that. Here is the online display again. And if you look at uh, the brightest uh, photomultipliers, like this one here, you see there is a peak of photons when the neutrino interact, and then there is a peak when the tau decays. Uh, we'll ha we have an analysis where we have found many of these taus, and that's again something that will be published soon, probably in physical review letters. Uh, 
Then we found one event, which by itself is a 5.2 sigma discovery of cosmic neutrinos. And it's uh, anti-electron neutrino that doesn't interact with a nucleus, but with an atomic electron and then makes a weak intermediate boson that decays into two jets. And here is the event on the right. And uh, if we reconstruct its energy, the energy of the neutrino to produce an ATGF intermediate, charge intermediate boson is 6.32 PeV. And you see that the, the pleasure was that uh, not to detect this event, but also to realize that all our software have produced the energy correctly. Uh, and so you see here the, con the reconstruction of the event. The other thing we learned is that uh, this event, of course, has a known cross section. Uh, this is the deep inelastic cross section for producing neutrinos as a function of energy. This uh, cross section called the glacial resonance is given by the pink line here. And uh, we know what its value is. So from one event, we can determine the flux. And this flux is totally consistent with the flux we measured in two other ways before. So there is no evidence that this flux cuts off at high energy. And there is no evidence yet that it turns over at low energy. So it extends to one. TV or so, which will be important for later discussions. In fact, not later discussions now. And so I'm going to come back to uh, the gamma rays that where are the gamma rays that accompany these neutrinos? And uh, that I will introduce what's called the efficiency dilemma by Marcus Botcher which will be a team further in the talk. So here you see the diffuse, the EBL, which peaks at CMB, goes through the different wavelengths. And then you see the gamma ray measurements and then the absorption of the gamma rays on the three degree background. If you look at the extension, you see this is an old version of our neutrino data. Uh, it looks like the neutrino data Actually, the, the, the energy in neutrinos in the universe exceeds that in gamma rays. And so we will look at this uh, relation in a bit more detail uh, next. So let's do an exercise. Here is uh, an early version of our data. Uh, and if you fit this, with e to the minus 2.15, you see, and it doesn't matter whether you cut it off or not, just take a power. You come on the back of an envelope. Yeah, I mean, if you know the neutrinos, you know the number of photons, as I explained in the beginning. Then you dump these photons in the microwave background. And so you predict that the photons accompanying the neutrinos end up on the red line. And you see this red line saturates the diffuse flux seen by Fermi, at least at high energies. Uh, and uh, you say, well, that's interesting. So Fermi is seeing the same sources as you do. But this e to the minus 2.15 is not really the right answer, unlikely to be the right answer. So uh, you see, anyway, some of the points exceeds our fit. And so you say, well, here is a better fit. But if I now calculate for this fit, which is more realistic and closer to the data, you see then I end up way above the Fermi uh, observations. That's not a problem. What that means is that wherever these neutrinos were produced and the photons are produced, the photons lost energy in the source before even reaching the microwave background. And so they are shifted to lower energy, MEV, X-rays, or wherever. So it's an indication that the sources are obscure. And so this is an exercise using a power. Here is 
the same exercise in a slightly different way. So here are four measurements of the diffuse flux. Uh, again, some that I have not shown yet, but it doesn't matter. So I fit these in uh, four different ways. And so for each of these, I calculated the accompanying photon flux, which is inevitable. Remember, for every uh, neutrino, there's a photon of twice the energy. And so if I do this calculation like before with a more realistic fit, only in the energy where we actually observe the neutrinos, you see are close to, I'm close to the Fermi data, but here, this measurement, uh, which is slave of PL elasticity, you see it exceeds, even with this more conservative fits, the Fermi background. And uh, I showed you the two new measurements of the diffuse flux that extended to one TeV. And you see, if this extends, if this doesn't turn over, you're going to go in the situation that is going to keep rising. So in this region, we actually measure, we can certify from the diffuse flux that the sources producing the neutrinos are opaque to the gamma rays in the region that Fermi can detect them. And so that they, where do they come out? Well, they come out at MeV or below. And so uh, the neutrino sources are likely to be opaque uh, to gamma rays. And that's independent of any observation of a source. Uh, this should not become a surprise, and it kind of forces us to reset our thinking about how we do uh, multi messenger astronomy. It's not like uh, you have neutrinos, well, and then you have gamma rays and you observe both. It's a bit more tricky because to have enough, to have a target that produces enough uh, neutrinos, you have to have. Uh, an absorption length, tau p gamma, that is uh, given by the escape time from the target times the kinematic factor times the p gamma cross section times the number of target photons. And that has to be a healthy number, like close to one, in order to produce neutrinos. If the target is transparent to protons, you don't produce neutrinos. But that same source, will then also be a target for the gamma rays that you produce with the neutrinos. And so you get uh, the photons, you get the size of the target times the kinematic factor times the gamma gamma cross section times the same target density. So in the end, your gamma, if I take these two numbers roughly, uh, you know, this of order one, the size of the target and the escape, then uh, you find that the gamma gamma absorbed the optical depth is about 300 times the ratio so the ratio of the cross sections the efficient the optical depth for absorbing the protons so if you have a healthy source with an optical depth and i just argued the optical depth is more likely bigger than one uh for uh then the photons will inevitably be observed so this tells you that something like a blazar jet, which is transparent to photons, doesn't produce neutrinos. Unless you do very tricky things with multiple zone models and things like that. So we have first hints of sources. Finding sources is not easy because if you look uh, at, uh, this is one year of data, that I can show you with the resolution of PowerPoint. We have 10 years of data. And so it contains 138,000 neutrinos. And um, the purity of this sample is something like 97%. These are real neutrinos, not cosmic ray muons. Uh, and uh, I showed you that more than 100, about 120, 
cosmic neutrinos are somewhere living in this 138,000. That's, of course, a huge problem. But we have already learned from the diffuse flux, if you look above 100 TeV or so, then they are almost, they are very likely to be cosmic in origin. Uh, in fact, the crossover is somewhere around 60 TeV, where the cosmic dominates the atmospheric. So what can you do? You can, for instance, take a map from different measurements where you only look at the neutrinos that are uh, likely to be cosmic in origin, say more than 50%, which is the case for this map. Of course, some of them are uh, five sigma uh, cosmic in origin. So then, we spent many years trying to find a correlation between these neutrinos, their direction, and astronomical maps. And that was spectacularly unsuccessful. Uh, the only hint we saw is uh, when we looked at catalogs, X-ray catalogs, and then selected active galaxies by their infrared emission. So you start with uh, standard X-ray catalogs, we saw a correlation, which is not striking, but was, uh, I don't know, it's said so, it's 2.6 uh, sigma, if I remember well, in the 0.5 to 2 keV region. So that was a hint of possibly correct connection with X-ray source. Ah, there it is, yeah. So the fit to the events was e to the minus 2.03, and uh, the post-trial 2.6 sigma. That uh, is a hint, but not more than that. So let's come back to this map. And so we developed a technique to find sources in this map. And uh, the technique is called uh, maximum likelihood. And I'm sure you're, most of you are familiar with this. But to give you an impression of how this works, this is a map, uh, a part of a map, a couple of by uh, of degrees, uh, several degrees wide. And here you see a blow up. And in red, you see a source. This source actually is something, uh, although it's a, it's a simulation of something I will talk about. It's uh, the 10 year observation of TXS0506 in this, in the 10 year sky map. It's 3.7 sigma post trial. And uh, so you see, uh, it's not spectacular. And if I don't color the points, it looks like that. So you don't see anything. It's so everywhere this map is dominated by background. Remember 120 on 138,000 per year. And so the technique is that you optimize the likelihood that the, at this point, for instance, which may be the direction of the excess, uh, at this point, the, the events cluster into a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution and uh, form a cluster of events. And then you can also fold this with the likelihood that events have a higher energy than the surrounding background. And so you, come, you make a best fit uh, of a number of events, NS, with uh, clustering within a distribution a Gaussian distribution, and then you compare that with the rest of the events and the likelihood that you have only background instead of a signal clustering in a Gaussian. And you compare these two, and you do this at every point in the map, which is a problem because with our resolution, that means a number of trials of about 100,000. So that's quite a challenge. Uh, also, we know from our simulation, we can simulate our experiment perfectly. We know that our uh, signal PDF is not Gaussian. Come back to that later. Anyway, 10 years of data, we 
perform this analysis I just described. And so the hottest spot on this map is uh, NGC 1068. And the other thing we found is that this map is not quite uniform anymore. It, uh, it shows evidence of non-uniformity, uh, which results mostly from four extragalactic source candidates. And so, of course, with the 100,000 trials, it's tough to get anything above two sigma, although NGC does stick out. But we also avoid the 10 to the 5 trials by searching a pre-selected list of 110 sources, which you see in front of you, and which were pre-selected because they are gamma ray sources, which after what we learned from the diffuse flux may not be that smart. But anyway, the four sources that stick out are TXS 0506, NGC 1068, uh, and then two other sources, which are similar active galaxies with, a, with a, a hot core and a corona, as I explained in the model. And one way of looking at this, let's just look at the blue lines here. So for our analysis, the dashed line is our sensitivity as a function of, of uh, zenith angle. So these are neutrinos coming through the Earth. These come from above. The blue is the five sigma discovery potential. And here you see the four sources clustering around the five sigma. Uh, this is pre-trial, of course. So that's interesting, but this could be very well fluctuations, although this source you will hear about later again. Uh, and so these four sources, which now the astronomers uh, refer to as uh, masquerading blazars, are again the image of the X-ray corona hot core of uh, an active galaxy like NGC 1068. And, uh, Remember, 1068 was a favorite source of everybody, whether you did neutrinos or gamma rays, but it was because it was a star-forming galaxy. And this is uh, the star formation cannot be the origin of the neutrinos we see because uh, the gamma rays are obscured. From a star forming region, we have to see the gamma rays as well as neutrinos. We only see the neutrinos. Let me skip this. This is the ice cube measurement with, uh, one, uh, with several uh, levels of error bars. So here you see again the energy in the source uh, the, as a function of the energy of the neutrinos. That's our measurement. It's a rather steep to the minus 3.8 flux. And here you see a model fit. And, and notice, uh, these are magic upper limits. There are no gamma rays accompanying these neutrinos, uh, although there are gamma rays at lower energy. And so here you see uh, a simple model fit to the ice cube data, and the accompanying gamma rays come out here at uh, MEV energy, uh, the, uh, where we, of course, have uh, no instrumentation to look for the source, uh, for sources. So this can be done in incredible detail. Here you see another description. But here again, uh, the accompanying gamma rays are at MEV and below. So. The, the more important question, however, is are these real sources or not? And that's what we went to chase after publishing what I just uh, described to you. And we did this in two, two, two major efforts. One was to improve the geometry of the detector to find exactly where the photomultipliers were in the ice, and by indirect methods, of course. And, uh, to find out their orientation and improve the simulation. Also, instead of 
simulating a genetic PMT, we actually calibrated the one PE acceptance of each PMT individually and simulated it every, and simulated every PMT individually. Then we tackled the problem that we knew from our, uh, our simulation that the point spread function of the telescope is not Gaussian. If you look at the inset picture, here are two examples. This is the direction of a neutrino. This is its uh, angle uh, the, in degrees. And this is the Gaussian fit. However, we know from the simulation that the actual uh, point spread function of the telescope, the neutrino direction, is, uh, has a, a tail and is displaced. And uh, so here is a, a more dramatic example. And uh, this, of course, depends on what, uh, whether you have a soft or a hard spectrum of your source. And so we switched to using the correct point spread function of the telescope, uh, abandoning the Gaussian. Then, of course, in the meantime, all these beautiful neural networks came along to improve our reconstruction of energy and pointing, which now on average at high energy, as I mentioned, is 0.3 degrees. And we applied it to the better calibrated data. Of course, we have all our whole data on tape, 10 years of it by now. And so you just don't apply it to future data. You can apply it to the 10 year of uh, data taken in, in, the, in the previous decade. And so uh, we redid the analysis. And of course, uh, I uh, wouldn't be telling you this if uh, the results didn't improve significantly from what I told you. And this is embargoed by science, but uh, you will get to find out about it in a couple of weeks. Uh, we also are making a major effort to improve uh, the ice, the knowledge of the ice, and uh, by, by deploying more strings and calibration devices. So this will be a much bigger detector, even uh, a much better and bigger detector before we ever construct uh, the second generation detector. I'm going to finish this talk. So this is far how far I go, we got. However, in 2016, frustrated by not being able to tell the origin of the neutrinos, we started a different game. And the game is to, to reconstruct what we, let me say it differently. What we typically do is when we measure an event, it's reconstructed at the surface by a cluster of computers. Then it's sent by satellite to Madison, Wisconsin, where it's the, the, the fits are uh, refined, and then they are sent to the collaboration. So what we decided to do is, whenever we find a high energy event, we, uh, we fit it at the pole and send it automatically over satellite, over iridium satellite, to the astronomical community, typically within 30 seconds, less than one minute. And uh, so we send the probability that the event is cosmic, the direction, and the energy. And so then the astronomy can, community can follow up or not. Uh, this struck uh, gold in uh, 2017 when we saw this event, 290 TeV. So remember, the crossover is somewhere. This event is li very likely to be cosmic in origin. Uh, we send the direction uh, out as a telegram, and we found that it aligned with TXS of 506, which is uh, a known blazer, Fermi, observes in high energy gamma rays. And uh, it had been flaring for a few weeks, which made the association more interesting. But this association is only 
uh, at a level of one in a thousand, this can be uh, accidental. What made this event real is whatever, what happened afterwards. Uh, the event was eventually five days later observed. It was looked at at the time of the emission by all three gamma ray telescopes, and the, but not clearly seen. And the only thing that there was evidence that uh, there were daily variations, but not clear observation. However, five days later, it was uh, identified as a TV gamma ray emitter of by, uh, by magic. And so we published this paper uh, with some 20 telescopes that studied these events, most of them to uh, identify the host galaxy, which was not easy given the, the very strong gamma ray signal from the TXS source in the galaxy. The second article, however, is uh, something we did with IceQ. Given a place to look, we looked at the past 10 years of data. And what I've been talking about is this flare, which is mostly made up of one high energy neutrino and some uh, higher energy, high energy, but not very high energy accompanying neutrinos. But in 2014, we found this flare which actually dominates the emission in the last 10 years. Uh, and that flare lasted for about 100 days. It has an e to the minus 2.2 spectrum. It's, uh, it's a dozen event, 19 on a background of less than six. And uh, it uh, has Eddington luminosity. And there is no gamma ray flare. Fermi doesn't see anything. It sees a handful of high energy photons, which leads to the idea of a steepening of flux, but you cannot even fit the power to the flux. So, uh, but there are a handful of high energy photons during this time. So here you see the observation. Of course, uh, interesting things happen afterwards, and I want to talk about them. Uh, here you see all the telescopes that looked over time at this event, with SWIFT actually being the first. Here you see Fermi, MAGIC, and the other telescopes eventually found the redshift of this source, which is uh, rather large, uh, 0 0.33 uh, in redshift. But interestingly enough and unknown, there was an optical telescope that actually looked at this source 73 seconds after the event. And what it saw was interesting. Here you see a summary. Here is the neutri are the neutrino data. Here are the Fermi data. Here are the optical observations. And here are the radio observations. Notice this source is flaring in radio. If, if the hot core, the cocoon, or whatever is responsible for the emission, just like it is for NGC, we think, uh, then it should uh, have a radio signal. But this is the optical observation. And the optical observation are these bluish ellipses. And notice this optical telescope has been observing this, this source since 2005. And nothing happened to this source except maybe a little glitch around the time of the 2014 burst, but it had a huge excursion right on top of uh, the neutrino. In fact, right on top here means two hours in a period of uh, 15 years. And you see, they, uh, they actually didn't publish. They looked to make sure this didn't happen. So they looked for several years to see this couldn't happen uh, as an instrumental glitch or so. And then they published. And so here is the data again. And so this is the flux derivative uh, of, uh, and so the source turned from off to on two hours after the event when it did absolutely nothing for 15 years. So of course, the, this is their paper. The, there are two things interesting about this. 
the statistics of this is totally compelling. Uh, the second thing is that you can associate a source and uh, in time, not just in space. And so this is an example where this is very powerful. Radio interferometry telescopes started to make images of this source. Here are two examples. And uh, the most important thing they found, of course, the source was, uh, was flaring, but they found that five milliard seconds beyond the black hole, this uh, source lost its tight collimation. So it hit some target that diffused the jet very close to the black hole. The target could be, you know, a star or whatever. And, uh, or it could be uh, a strong magnetic field, but the jet disappears very close to the black hole, which kind of reinforces again that uh, we are not really looking at a blazer, uh, a, a canonical blazer uh, for this soul, uh, for uh, especially not when the neutrinos are produced. So I come back to. Uh, to, to this efficiency dilemma, if you have a target to produce neutrinos, it is unlikely transparent to gamma rays. And this, we have argued, I won't go into this, that even uh, the 1709 uh, burst, the, the photons may have disappeared for a very short time. So that's the status, a summary here. Uh, we have two statistically in, in independent observations that are above the three sigma level. Then you have a high statistic uh, uh, association with optical, uh, made by optical uh, variation in the time domain. Remember, this was the second source after NGC 1068 by just looking at the whole sky map. And uh, so the idea is that we actually ob observe neutrinos in obscured flares. Of course, I don't have to tell you that you have only looked at a handful of examples. We have uh, analysis going on within Ice Cube that look for that look into the correlation uh, with uh, X rays using sources and. Uh, not just the total sky map, which is an, uh, an analysis I described earlier. And so this uh, is in progress and has interesting hints as well. But so uh, one more hint before I finish. Uh, the most energetic neutrino we ever received as an alert uh, is this one. It was uh, in uh, July 2019. It's a 300 TV neutrino, and it's aligned with PKS 1502 plus 106, which, not surprisingly, like all the other sources, is bursting in radio. Uh, and so if you look at the accompanying radio and gamma ray flux, this is the time that the neutrino is produced. You see, at the time the neutrino is produced, the gamma ray flux actually disappears and then comes up again. And this is again the type of thing was seen by the optical telescope, uh, robotic telescopes uh, for TXS. Uh, and it was flaring in radio, as you can see here. So, conclusion, oh, I just have to tell you, there are a lot of things I didn't talk about. For this audience, the more interesting thing is that uh, news soon about galactic sources, which I have not mentioned. There is actually another an interesting problem you can think about. We know that the extragalactic flux is at least 10 times higher than the galactic flux. That's not a secret. And so this is unlike any other wavelength of flight. So this is an interesting question to start thinking about.
So the detection of galactic uh, supernova, of course, this would be a great event if we could, we, we made a, a very detailed movie. We do a lot of other things with this detector. And most importantly, uh, we are uh, in the middle of the technical design for a next generation detector of eight times the volume of this one. The other good news is that we are uh, receiving company. Uh, PM3Net is being developed in the Mediterranean. And last I heard that something like 19 strings deployed and uh, had, uh, was producing evidence for uh, the diffuse flux. Lake Baikal is constructing a detector, which the most interesting news I heard was that uh, the highest energy event come from TXS0506. Uh, there are two plans to build telescopes in uh, China, of the, in the South China Sea, and one of the coast of Vancouver in Canada. And these are uh, all at the uh, development stage. Some deployments are already happening uh, in Canada. And then there is a whole list of telescopes too large to mention to look at neutrinos, not in the TV PV range, but in the EV range. So I conclude at this point, I will skip this. So what are the conclusions? Uh, the best thing I told you today is uh, that neutrino astronomy exists. We didn't know this until now. We obviously, from the whole discussion, the main conclusion you should draw is that we need more neutrinos, we need better neutrinos with better angle resolution, and we need more telescopes. We cannot, you know, you cannot work with one piece of data. I think I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm not trying to, although all the, reading the tea leaves points at course of active galaxies, that's not the point. The point is that I think we now have a technique to really close in on the sources of the cosmic rays, maybe even with Ice Cube before we get the next generation instruments, but definitely with the next generation inst instruments. And I'll stop here. Thank you. These are my collaborators. Um, Thank you, Francis. Felix, Thank you. You, want to, you want to lead this? Yeah, we just, uh, thanks Francis for a nice talk. So we have to start, uh, I don't know, a discussion or maybe start with a few very short questions and then we move to a uh, more detailed discussion. Any questions? Yeah, I have. Do you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Uh, it's Amir. I have a question. Uh, yes, Amir. Please. Do you, do you hear me? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, we hear you. I hear you. Okay, so a uh, quick one. Uh, assuming that uh, the entire neutrino background is indeed produced by blazers, like you know, the one you claim to have detected, then I wonder, you know, if you do a cumulative analysis, like you take a complete sample of these blazers, don't you expect to find a, a pretty strong signal on a, on a sample? Um, or I don't know, what's, what's the numbers? We have tried what you suggest in God knows how many ways. We have never been able to find any evidence. Uh, I think the reason the Fermi sky is mostly blazars is because they are so easy to detect because they produce these very high energy gamma rays. And uh, of course, our hope was that some of them would emit neutrinos. But as I try to explain is we are kind of on plan B of doing multi-messenger astronomy. Sources that are transparent in gamma rays uh, are probably not uh, good neutrino emitters because they have no target and to otherwise the photons wouldn't be there. 
And uh, this, so, this one is uh, this one is actually emitting gamma rays, right? Which one? Uh, Tx, whatever. The, the no, one... no, not it. You see, we can argue forever about the 2017 event, but the 2014 event, which is responsible for most of its emission uh, over 10 years, is not accompanied by gamma rays. The gamma rays is, are at uh, the level of background. So, and uh, it's not clear whether exactly at the time, remember that we didn't know that in 2017, but the time scale that these neutrinos are emitted may be very short. And so what I would argue is that from, you know, reading the present data, which, all, which is all I can do, it looks like uh, whatever the sources are, they do emit gamma rays at the time they emit neutrinos. All our data is consistent with that. No, but that's fine, but you can identify them from, let's say, you know, they are already yeah. allowed. So to come back to your question, oh, yeah, you can, uh, I try to identify them uh, by by radio loud. Okay. Because so we tried, we tried to to make correlations to Fermi blazars, of course, which is most of the, which are, uh, most of their sources are blazars. And we have done that in many different ways with many different additional assumptions. This is all published. And uh, as I said, it was unsuccessful. Uh, it and we tried many other things that were unsuccessful, uh, but the, the blazar correlation. Now doing it uh, by radio, that is at the moment, uh, you saw that the sources, the promising sources I was talking about, all are in, uh, there is a radio flare coincident with the neutrino observations. So, and that's what you expect when you have, uh, when, if the origin is what I speculated on, is uh, the core of an active galaxy that has a cocoon and uh, has possibly a, a jet. And so, that has been tried too. Uh, it was first tried by a group of Russian theorists and uh, they found correlations. Many other people found correlations, but they never reached the, the level of five sigma. Then it was repeated by our public, by, uh, with public data from IceCube. We made 10 years of IceCube data public and Zhao and Kamionkovsky reanalyzed the correlation with radio flares and uh, contradicted uh, the Russian claim and didn't find any correlation. The only thing I can say is that we have reproduced the Zhao and, and Kamionkovsky paper and agree with it. That doesn't mean we have not reproduced any of the other papers. Uh, we are doing our own analysis now. But so this question is open, I would say. It would be nice to find a correlation. And there are uh, certain examples that are promising, like the PKS example I showed at the end. Uh, but so if cores of active galaxies are, are the answer, then uh, there, there probably is some kind of correlation. Most of these cores emit radio. Okay, we, it seems we entered to the discussion part, so maybe we we just continue. May I just uh, just trigger one one discussion in the same context: correlation, multi messenger, etc. So I mean, uh, uh, for neutrinos, we're detecting neutrinos energies more than ten hundred TV. I think it's. Um, uh, just to make things very simple and move to see what could be correlations or not. It's clear that there are two processes, right? PP and P gamma. So if you are talking about blazars, PP is kind of almost nonsense because the um, you don't have a material to produce so okay. many gamma rays. So you need a very heavy jet, which you not, not could even move with uh, speed of light 
such a heavy jet. So that is, it's really, I'm sorry, just at least I think it's a kind of nonsense PP, but P gamma, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's P gamma, it's more, um, unless I'm talking about blazar, distant blazars. Of course, for nearby sources like 1006, that is also from the physics point of view, it looks much reliable. But what I want to say, okay, we stick to P gamma. So P gamma, then we should ask, do you expect in P gamma GV gamma rays? Do you expect in P gamma TV gamma rays, et cetera? So GV gamma rays, of course, Fermi lot, we don't expect much because you know spectrum is very, it peaks at TV energies and goes down. So even without uh, having absorbed them, absorbing them, then not too much uh, we expect at GV energies. Uh, TV, yes, do we expect. And Francis mentioned that there could be absorption. Um, but Francis, this is my comment or uh, you compared P gamma and gamma gamma, the uh, gamma gamma optical depths. I think it should be compared not optical depths, but for P gamma, you should uh, compare confinement time because cosmic rays spend more time inside the source. They don't go right linearly. So this direct it should be, it is, you still could connect, but it should be done in this way rather than uh, comparing uh, optical depths. And the second point is just the peaks, when you pick the P gamma and you pick the gamma gamma, they are different. They could be essentially different. So then you have to extrapolate target photon um, range to get uh, the, uh, of course, we, we could, uh, we should do some extrapolation, but I want to say a lot of, there are a lot of uncertainties related also this. So uh, just, as I said, I want to trigger discussion. multi wavelengths are very important, clearly, but sometimes we should not just simply uh, believe that there should be correlations uh, and should be uh, kind of um, nice spectral fits, so that, 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 uh, and I, I just want to emphasize, I'm talking about distant, very powerful blazars, which automatically imply production in the jets. If not in the jet, in the large Doppler uh, factors, forget about detecting neutrinos even gamma rays. So then we come to the specifics of these jets. So we have to be a bit, a bit not careful, so carefully compare fluxes, conditions, etc. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me answer this part first. I'm sure you have more, but uh, I, I made the discussion all in the context of P gamma. Whether it's P gamma or PP is actually not a big deal. Uh, the cocoon, the cocoons we know have a uh, optical depth in, in atomic matter, in, in not in gamma rays, but in proton of uh, 10 to the 24 to 10 to the 25 in some cases. So it could equally well be PPSP gamma. In fact, in this detail, in some of the detailed models that theorists make, uh, I have in this talk trying to stick to the evidence and, and not go into theoretical modeling. Uh, but uh, uh, for instance, may but I, may let, I me, let me point out, okay. they fit both P gamma and PP. And typically what that leads to is, the, is uh, a tail at the highest energy that's due to PP in these uh, cocoon models. Uh, Francis, when I'm talking yeah. about from energetics point of view, you need, you cannot simply multiply flags to this square. You, you need to reduce luminosity. Otherwise you run to the unbelievable luminosity is 10 to 50 Earth per second. You have to run, go down at least 10 to 46, 45. And that is a way, a simple way with Doppler uh, uh, boosting. Yeah. So, it's, so that is way. So it so, means you produce gamma rays in the jet. Let, 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 I'm coming to that next. 
Yeah, and I agree with you there. Uh, you know, I have no objection to, to place as being neutrino sources. I, I have nothing to sell. <laughs> so, but I agree. In fact, I made your argument. If you saw, I, I won't go back to the slide, but uh, unless you want me to. When I compare the optical depth of protons and gamma rays, so of course, you need an optical depth to protons or you don't produce neutrinos, so you have to stop the protons on a target. The ratio of the optical depth is a factor 300 in, uh, for the systems I'm discussing. It's a factor 300. And so if you, you can change this, as I showed, by... Uh, keeping the protons in the source producing neutrinos, so the escape time, you can make much longer than the size of the source. Yeah, that is my point. But you have, you're fighting a factor of 300. You could Not get a factor of 100 with a confinement time. Yeah, no that's what, yes. And then, then you, you are in business. I haven't seen, you know, you know that theorists, I don't want to go into this, have, have modeled these this jets and tried to produce the neutrinos. And uh, they are simply not able to produce the neutrino fluxes from the excess we see, period. So what you suggest then is possible and has been tried. And uh, maybe they didn't try hard enough, but uh, uh, you know, the level of flux we see from the sources, uh, nobody has uh, been able to, to produce a jet model that gives you the right uh, answer. Yes, I know that is the problem, but yeah. nevertheless, what I wanted to say, just very fact, if we assume we do see neutrinos, uh, such high energies, and then we know sensitivity of the instruments, there's no other way just to reduce, we have to reduce the apparent luminosities to the intrinsic luminosity by factor of three, uh, order of magnitude three or four. And that is exactly what we do also if gamma rays is the same. So I just want to say this only way to produce for distance objects is not 10 or 68. It's another story, it's a nearby source. Then, but, but then Fre we Felix, that, that doesn't again. contradict. And what I wanted to say, I want to say very simple thing. Uh, Felix, that doesn't contradict the possibility of having PP production. If you uh, have a jet breakout through, a, a, let's say, dense material, you know, you, you will have relativistic jet in uh, behind the reverse shock, but you know, your, your uh, cosmic rays can escape into the envelope. So in, in principle, you can produce beam the neutrino no, beam. No, no, when, when you, uh, want to, you want to imagine you want to have variability. I mean, uh, day variability, hour variability, you need density, 10 to, 10 to 10 more, and imagine you have such a density in the jet. I mean, that is, you, it's, it's uh, uh, anyway, I don't like to go just to do, to, to do much this, this. I just wanted to say that PGAM is, if, if really there are neutrinos, for distance, this PGAM is more realistic. And then if Pigama works, then we don't expect uh, formally the, the, the in Fermi band uh, no, no, should not be correlation without any absorption in working. And for TV, I just wanted to, that my comment was very simple. When um, um, uh, Francis compared this optical depth, I just want to say it's not so dramatic. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, Pigama and PP. So, just say you should not be gamma rays. Uh, so gamma rays, in order to effectively produce neutrinos, you need a good confinement as well. And with a good confinement, the situation is not as bad as 300 difference in cross sections. Yeah, we, we agree. And I, you know, if you look at my slide, it explicitly shows the factor of the confinement time over the size of the source. Yeah. And that's obviously important. So we agree. No, I don't contradict. I just want to say to take these uh, uh, things that when we are talking about multi-wavelength is not just obviously should 
every way expect correlation. So yeah. things could be now, much more complex. If I can come back to how this discussion started, we did try to make correlations with Fermi blazars in all possible ways, including something you suggest looking at the lowest energies rather than the higher energies, right? Because, uh, you know, I mean, the, the gamma rays may be sitting at MEV or so. And, uh, but we have not been able to find any correlation. Uh, our data are, are original, not the new data, but the old data is public. And our new data will be public soon, as soon as we publish. So, you know, you can try for yourself. It, there is no correlation. Um, In fact, if I can bring the discussion at the, at the kind of less technical level, what I have a hard time dealing with is why is the gamma ray flux, I mean, clearly, if you look just for dead sources, look at the discussion of the diffuse flux. If the gamma ray flux is really, uh, of the gamma ray flux accompanying neutrinos is higher than the Fermi flux, how is this really possible? Because the discussion shows you need rather special sources to produce neutrinos. And with any accelerated electron, you can create gammas in the universe. So how is this possible that when you look at the high energy universe, it's dominated by the gammas from neutrinos when you can get them much easier by radiating them from, from electrons. So there is the energy problem you are talking about exists at a diffuse level. Well, well diffuse level is another story, of course, but uh, yeah, I think maybe not. It is another story because it's, it's yes, I mean, it's very nice diffuse, uh, Fermi diffuse is perfect upper limit on the entire luminosity of entire universe. So that is that is very interesting thing, which implies that universe is not extremely powerful in TV, PV part, because uh, just really, we had a very old paper with Paolo Coppi, just 20 years old paper when just we calculated actually the luminosity of the universe based on this kind of things. So yes, but it's just, again, I don't like to, to disturb with this, but I just want to say this multi-wavelength, sometimes we take very, not, not in your talk generally, in a simple way. There are gamma rays, should be neutrinos, or it could be very, you know, I can bring also another very trivial example. I mean, gamma rays are, if now if you are talking about PP, not maybe not quasars, not gamma rays are produced if the particles escape accelerator and hit the gas, the cloud. So if high energy gamma rays propagate faster, they reach earlier. So inside the cloud, you see extremely hard spectrum, deficit of low energy cosmic rays because they didn't reach. So it, again, it's not maybe not, nothing to do with quasars, but there are many ways just to have no correlation. Yeah. which makes it really exciting. I mean, actually it increases the significance of neutrino studies because if they're correlation, then I say, okay, then why I need neutrinos? I, I'll do the same with others. So in that sense, I just want to say correlation is not something very obvious and that yeah. is exciting, I mean. I think that's, that's actually the, the point I was trying to bring across that correlation is not obvious. Sometimes it is actually, if we had been seeing, say, star forming regions in galaxies, there would have been a simple correlation between gamma rays and neutrinos. We wouldn't be having this discussion now. So there are cases where uh, multi-messenger astronomy is, uh, is, as, uh, is totally transparent. Also, when you look at galactic sources, there has to be a simple correlation. So it's not always uh, challenging, like what we are dealing with here and with NGC 1068. 
Oh, could we just move to that? Maybe, I mean, that is interesting. I provoke you to say maybe something more that we know. I guess you'll not, but it is really very exciting source, not only this five sigma, also if I may say that some from point, point of view theory, that is much more reliable. I mean, it's nearby dense, so that then my arguments, which I said that they do not work, so could be also PP. Could you say something more about that? I mean, the uh, so it is a steady source, or you see variable, variable, variable uh, some some variability. Uh, we haven't looked at the time. Uh, you haven't looked Remember, we religiously follow blindness and and formulate analyses, and uh, uh, we are looking at the time. But uh, I don't know. I'm not hiding. It's not science or anything. I just don't know whether there is any time dependence. It would be very surprising, I think. I guess five sigma is uh, should be composed from maybe not many, but some several at least gamma rays. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I I, don't I couldn't know. imagine five sigma in that. Otherwise, so there's a spread in time between these photons you detected, or Oh, sorry, if it's uh, maybe I should not provoke this kind yeah. of <laughs> If it's under the embargo, so maybe that-, that Well, no, I, I don't, uh, well, I do care. <laughs> I don't want to lose the publication, but uh, uh, we have a large number of neutrinos from this source. Yeah, that is my, yes. We have not looked at the time dependence, and, uh, but, uh, oh, sorry. But uh, I, yeah, I don't, I, I shouldn't say it because I don't know. Okay, okay. then a then, uh, technical question. I assume, assume I mean, I, I, as soon as we have an answer on that, it will present it at conferences. No, no, yes, maybe my question is not appropriate. I, I, yeah, I, but it's also, I, I honestly don't know. But maybe more technical questions. They not all come at the same time or anything like that, because that I, I would have noticed playing with the, yeah. the neutrinos. But now less tricky, less tricky question, uh, Francis. If you said that that is almost obvious, that should be uh, at least several neutrinos, maybe many. I mean, so because five sigma, from we could conclude from that. So now question is, uh, why you... It's new technique which allowed you to uh, get this many neutrinos or uh, because from statistics point of view, I mean, what was two years ago? Why couldn't see that two years ago? Because of the detection technique? I mean, yeah. Or, uh, well, I, yeah, I won't go back, unless you want me to, I won't go back to the slide, but I had this slide, it, it's the improvement in detector calibration and uh, improvement in uh, the energy and direction measurements using neural nets. And it's the improvement in the point spread function of the telescope. You know, with Gaussians, we were overestimating the precision of the telescope at the pointing. And as you know, you lose sensitivity, whether your point spread function is too small or too large, it has to be just right. And so it are these three factors that uh, combine to make the improvement. Uh -huh. Did you apply that to this Texas source? You, you, yeah, you, yeah. And, you will see the result. And did you get improvement? Uh, The Texas, well, the answer is yes, but uh, uh, it's difficult because for the Texas, the, the, I cannot go into, I, I don't have the slides actually to go into discussion, but you have to realize it's not just the better, it's worse. Yeah, the source is obviously uh, improved in significance, all of them. But uh, you're comparing two different analyses. And for instance, uh, there is another aspect that the, 
the sample we published before in physical review letters, which is the old sky analysis I described, didn't have the purity of this new sample. That's another point. Okay. With the improved analysis techniques, the, the, purity, the purity of this neutrino sample is over 97%, which was not the case of the one uh, of the analysis I described. So, so you cannot directly compare the two analyses. You, you get uh, different signatures. Okay, thanks. Some other questions, comments? Uh, I guess no one's asking, Francis, yeah, is there any evidence for a spectral break with PASS-2? Like, uh, you showed there are probably two different sources. Maybe there's a 1068 and then there's one blazar. Maybe there are two. I might expect the maximum energies to be different in the classes, so I might expect the neutrino spectrum to be different. And so the diffuse background might show a break or a curvature. Is there any evidence of that? So I, populations? I am not sure I, I understand your question. Uh, yeah. uh, you could might imagine like the 1068 uh, sources don't have protons that go to such high energy, so they have a steep neutrino spectrum. The blazer ones might have a much harder proton and neutrino spectrum. Yes. Yes, the background would show a break or a curvature, possibly. Well, yeah, okay, now I got it. The answer is, uh, well, you see the data, right? You can go, I'll send you the slides. You can go and look for yourself. You can imagine, uh, in fact, one of the, okay, let me answer your question very specifically. Remember when we first, uh, the first discovery of cosmic neutrinos was made by looking at all neutrinos starting inside the detector. And uh, it doesn't give you very many high energy events, but it gave us a, a rather steep spectrum, steeper than uh, the 2.5, which all the analysis I showed you kind of tend to converge on. Now, we have repeated that analysis of the starting events with uh, eight or nine years of data and published it not so long ago, and it still shows a somewhat steeper spectrum. Now, it's a completely different analysis. So, and the statistics, so you may think if you, if I, if you take that evidence, which uh, is now rather old and I didn't discuss, then you may think actually that the spectrum steepens at lower energy. And so, uh, of course, the NGC source is different from TXS source in the sense that it's not dominated by this very high energy neutrinos. Uh, it, uh, and it shows a steeper spectrum. So you can imagine that, uh, you know, the different spectra that we observe for these uh, candidates are, uh, are related to, to a change in, in slope in the diffuse spectrum. I don't think we have done anything close to ruling out that uh, the diffuse spectrum has some energy dependence. Mm -hmm. Because as you see, each, each analysis we do is uh, as a limited energy range. And then we kind of uh, connect them together in one new F new plot. So uh, I think there is lots of opportunity to, to, if we keep accumulating data and refining the diffuse analysis uh, to find a structure in that spectrum. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so it was very, very, very nice talk and very interesting discussion. Uh, so maybe you have to close the session. Uh, just to tell you, just already Reshmi sent a message to everyone that we'll have another neutrino talk next in, in two weeks by Anna Mels. And that is on extremely high energy neutrinos. 
which are equally important and interesting as Francis already indicated. So that would be very nice coupling of these two talks. Okay, thank you very much, Francis, again, and then see you in two weeks. Thank you, everybody. Thanks again, Francis. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.